The third face is uh, terrorism directly against us, i.e. against the West at home. Not against Western forces in Afghanistan, but against Western countries in the West. Now here, at least until the location of bin Laden, which I must say gave me cause to question some of my previous assumptions, to be perfectly honest. But at least until the location and death of bin Laden, I would have said that on that score, the Pakistanis had been generally, though by no means always, supportive and helpful. They are certainly not backing terrorists, I mean the Pakistani authorities and the military, to come and attack the West. And for that, there are two reasons. Uh, the first is they see absolutely no interest in it. They, they don't see how that could possibly help the, the national interests of Pakistan. A subset of that, uh, true of some of the military, but even more true of the political uh, elites in Pakistan, is that, not that I'm not sure it's touch wood when saying these things, God forbid, but you know, if, if one were to imagine a, a sort of... A, 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 a likely target um, for an Islamist bomb attack in London. Um, how about Harrods, you know, symbolizing Western decadence and the way that we've corrupted, you know, elites in the Muslim world? Well, that's the whole point, of course. Any bomb in Harrods in any given day would take out a chunk of the Pakistani elite. <laughs> any bomb in Knightsbridge would take out at least a small bunch of them. They live here. It's, it's so often easier, not generals, it must be said, except certain retired generals. But as far as Pakistani politicians, even ministers, even chief ministers are concerned, it's often much easier to find them in London than it is in their offices um, back in Pakistan. Uh, so no interest in it, but secondly, if there is one thing which has been made abundantly clear to them by uh, America, and once again these people are not lunatics, it's that if there were another major successful terrorist attack in the United States traced to Pakistan, especially traced to a group um, with links to the Pakistani military, the roof would fall on their heads. Um, and they did, you know, they did see after 9-11 uh, how the United States did for a while go seriously crazy. Um, and once again, these people are not suicidal. The high command. Now, the problem is, of course, whether Pakistani intelligence is fully on side here. Now, this is very difficult to say because, of course, there is a tendency in Pakistan, a sort of nod and a wink, to say, well, you know these Johnnies in strange characters, of course, you have some strange characters in your own intelligence, don't you? You know, not always sure what they're doing. And um, if one looks at the history of uh, French intelligence, to take one example, well, yes, I mean, intelligence services, particularly intelligence services in competition, do sometimes have a way of wandering off. Uh, particularly, of course, if they have been dealing with certain groups or operating cer with certain groups over a very long period of time. The command of the ISI, the high command, is made up of career soldiers and is part of the high command of the army as a whole. After all, General Kayani, the present chief of staff, was previously head of the ISI and so forth. Uh, I don't believe that the ISI as an institution will ever uh, carry out uh, a strategy uh, that has not been approved and ordered by the high command. The problem is a different one. Uh, it is that ever since the 1980s, when they creamed off a considerable proportion of the aid which America, Saudi Arabia, and to a lesser extent Britain, were giving to the Afghan Mujahideen through the ISI. Not just the ISI as a whole, but so I've been told, cells within the ISI have had their own secret, independent, and permanent sources of funding which allow them to operate without the knowledge of their senior officers. And here what you have to understand about the ISI is that the commanders are seconded regular military officers, but of course the rank and file doing the in actually operating with the Taliban, the Mujahideen, the anti-Indian terrorists, they are career intelligence officers mostly. They are the ones with the institutional continuity and so forth. Now, if they also have their own secret sources of funds, that is worrying and would you know, enable them, as I say, to pursue separate strategies. Very difficult to say for sure. 
So anyway, that is um, the thing there. But as far as the ISI as a whole is concerned, certainly the army is con concerned, they are not interested in carrying out terrorism directly against the West. And they have a very, you know, even in Abbottabad itself, they have a mixed record. Because a few weeks, a few couple of, three months before the um, uh, location and death of bin Laden, uh, they did actually arrest a fairly prominent Indonesian terrorist, one of those responsible for planning the Bali bombings uh, in Abbottabad, and they handed him over to the Indonesian authorities. So, mixed, difficult. Then there is the fourth face of um, their attitude uh, to terrorism, and that is terrorism against India. Now here, of course, they were absolutely intimately involved in this for years and years, promoting it, backing it, arming these people. Since the attack on Mumbai in 2008 by an organization that the uh, Pakistani military was instrumental, not in creating but in building up, and there's every evidence that the ISI planned that operation even if they didn't execute it. It's not quite clear why the decision was made when it was and by whom. Um, since then, they seem to have realized that this is too dangerous, um, in part because, of course, the growing closeness of America and India, and so they've called off the campaign. But they've told their allies, just wait, wait, it's not over. The day will come one day. Now, what are their attitudes to the anti-Indian terrorists? Well, one, obviously they don't, like Lashkari Taiba, which carried out Mumbai, A, Obviously, they mustn't join the Pakistani Taliban in revolt against the Pakistani state. Just, they mustn't destroy the Pakistani state. Secondly, uh, they mustn't attack the United States uh, or America's allies in Europe because that could come to exactly the same thing. Thirdly, as far as India is concerned, they have to stay on the shelf. As far as Afghanistan is concerned, open season. Officers will tell you, Pakistani officers, that they can't stop them. In fact, they're not really not stopping them. They're actually encouraging them to go there as a kind of safety valve. Because, and once again, things in Pakistan get damn morally complicated. Because the Pakistani officers will say to you, well, look, what do you want? I mean, we're sending them to Afghanistan. Well, you know, you don't have any more illusions about Afghanistan than we do. You also believe, at least you said so 20 minutes ago, that we're, you know, that we don't think this is going to work. Isn't it better that they should go there than either they should attack you in London or they should join the rebellion against us, at which point the terrorist and insurgent threat in Pakistan gets seriously worse uh, because Lashkar-e Taiba are one of the most formidable terrorist groups uh, on the planet at present. Well, what, uh, what attitude do you take towards that line, of course? Uh, well, I've had some interesting... <laughs> Um, nuances, shall we say, in the response between the Home Office here and the Minister of Defence. Uh, if indeed you are engaged in defending London, you might have one attitude. If it's your boys who are dying in Helmand, you might have a very different attitude. So, it gets complicated. Nonetheless, um, so far they have been able to tread this tightrope, more or less. In part, of course, because they are no longer simply dependent on the Americans for aid, they have China on their side. Not nearly as much on their side as they would like it to be. The Chinese are certainly not queuing up to pour money into Pakistan. They are just as sceptical of Pakistani corruption and competence as everybody else is. And secondly, the Chinese are not looking for trouble. Uh, at the same, you know, in other words, they don't want, want to do things that will infuriate um, the Americans or the Indians or give the Pakistanis the, the feeling that they've got a blank check shall we perhaps resume terrorism against India, for example. But equally, they are committed to the survival of Pakistan, which they see as, I mean, a backstop, a reserve option, but nonetheless a very serious asset, especially when it comes to potentially to energy routes if the sea routes across the Indian Ocean became highly problematic from their point of view. So they have this in the background. So in my view, the Pakistanis can probably trundle on the problem is that trundling on won't hack it. The reason it won't hack it is not to do with Islamist revolt, 
uh, it's not uh, even to do with short-term economic collapse. It's to do with the fact that, according to most sober estimates, by the middle of this century, they will have more than 330 million people in that country uh, with absolutely no increased water resources. There is an extremely grim World Bank report of 2004 about the likely consequences of all this, which I hasten to add operate before one even factors in the potential impact of climate change. You don't have to factor in what may or may not happen with, fact with climate change. You simply look at the existing water resources and the, the rise in the population. Now, of course, this is not a mathematical Malthusian thing. Even given the, the constraints of being dependent you know, on one monsoon and one river system, which, by the way, uh, of course, and climate change may or may not be responsible for this, as we've seen in the past two years, of course, produces catastrophic floods as well as droughts. But e even so, they have enough water. But improving conservation, improving distribution, uh, improving use of water would require something approaching a revolution in many aspects of the Pakistani system. And, as I hope I've indicated uh, in um, the course of this talk, uh, the very strengths of the Pakistani system, which prevent Islamist revolution, are also very likely to prevent what we would see as a positive form of revolution. Thank you. I should say, by the way, that, that uh, I tried to cut down on the, anec uh, the anecdotes for reasons of length, but by way of a small advertisement, fat though the book is, it is packed with anecdotes. I'm still a journalist at heart. Okay, would you like to take one? Of course.